The Matrix is a green screen in your mind, imprinting programming to make you believe it's real. It's not. Break free. Join me, Patricia Corey, and my guests on Beyond the Matrix, where there is light, where you can dare to be free. Beyond the Matrix. Beyond the Matrix for people who think outside the box of convention. And uh, if you don't already, well, you shouldn't be here because that's what we do. And today I have a very interesting uh, guest. You know, many of you are not aware that 10 years ago I had a radio program called Beyond the Matrix. I had some remarkable guests on. Um, and one of them was Thomas Greco. So he graciously decided to come back accept my invitation, come back on 10 years later. We actually figured out it's 11 years, oh my God. And it's a wonderful thing because he had some, maybe not, I wouldn't call them predictions, but visions of the new earth, of the new economy and uh, what that would look like. And here we are after the global health issue and how that is drastically affecting the economy. So we're gonna pick up from 10 years ago, from the things he saw and the things that exist today. Before I bring him on, I just want to give you a quick intro. Uh, Thomas Greco is a community and monetary economist, a former educator, writer, and consultant. He is a former tenured college professor who has dedicated decades of his life studying and writing about ways to achieve greater harmony, equity, and sustainability through business and economics. Most of all, he's a visionary of a world where humanity can create peace and focus on building new systems rather than destroying. And isn't that the dichotomy of where we are right now? So Thomas, thank you for coming back on after so many years. And um, just could you add to that little brief as to who you are, what you're up to now, and then we'll get rolling. Okay, well, thank you, Patricia, for having me back on. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be able to address your audience and to share some of my ideas and my visions with them. <clears throat> you know, I, uh, as you mentioned, I was a tenured college professor, uh, and I left that 14 years ago. Excuse me. <laughs> I left that after 14 years in 1979, more than 40 years ago, and I've been working independently ever since as an independent scholar, author, lecturer. And uh, I've written four books on the main concern, which is the money and banking system. Uh, I realized long ago in conducting my research into uh, the recurrent problems that we have in the world, uh, that the system of money, banking, and finance uh, was a major problem. Uh, actually the driving force of this, uh, uh, this growth imperative, as I call it. When you look at the way money is created today, it's created by banks making loans, and they create those loans with an interest uh, burden. So if you go to a bank and you say, uh, I want to borrow some money to buy a house or a car, uh, the bank will assess your ability to repay, and if they grant you the loan, you will have a certain amount of time to repay it. So when you borrow money from a bank, uh, they're actually creating that money basically out of thin air on the basis of your commitment uh, to repay it. But uh, since there's an interest burden attached to that loan, uh, you have to repay more than you borrowed. So the amount of money in circulation is never sufficient to enable everybody to pay what they owe. So we have this debt growth imperative, which creates an economic growth imperative. Uh, that's why we have uh, continual 
expansion of debt everywhere in the world. Even the most prosperous governments uh, have ballooning debt, which goes up year after year. And uh, conventional economists uh, just sort of wave their hands and dismiss this as being unimportant. But it's, uh, it's terribly important because it's an unsustainable situation and it's driving the world to destruction. We're looking at $27 trillion debt in the United States and it's still ballooning. What does that mean? At what, what is the breaking point <laughs> here? Well, that's the question. What is the breaking point? You know, uh, we've seen the monetary authorities apply increasingly desperate measures to try to keep this system alive. Uh, looking back to 2008 and the major financial meltdown that we had at the time, the whole global financial system was on the brink of collapse at that point. So what happened? Uh, the central banks and the governments got together and they decided that they would bail out the banks. They couldn't allow the banks to fail uh, with this cascading uh, series of defaults. So they allowed a few to go bust like uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, but the rest got bailed out. Basically the bad debts that the banks had created uh, in the, in the uh, boom phase of the cycle uh, by lending money to anybody for real estate purchases. Uh, they basically gave loans to anybody and everybody who came through the door without regards for uh, their ability to make payments on those loans. So eventually when people were unable to make those payments and keep them up, uh, those loans went into default. And the banks postponed as long as they could recognizing those defaults. And uh, it was sort of like uh, Wiley Coyote running off the cliff and not looking down. <laughs> and so, you know, eventually, <laughs> eventually uh, the collapse has to come and it did in 2008. But instead of letting the banks uh, take the hit for their malfeasance and creating this bubble, uh, the governments basically took the bad debts off their hands and gave them new government debt uh, as a substitute. So government debt is guaranteed. You know, the government and the Federal Reserve together can create unlimited amounts of money uh, to prevent any defaults by, by the government. All right, let me interrupt you for a moment, ask you a question. <clears throat> what would have happened if the banks, if the gov didn't bail the banks out and just let them fail? Do you think that that would have been a, a wiser alternative in the big picture? Well, the whole financial system would have frozen up. Nobody would have been able to pay their bills and uh, we would have had to shift over quite rapidly to a different system. But the world wasn't ready for that. Uh, the other possibility was for the banks to be nationalized, uh, which would have been basically a, a better approach because it would have uh, shifted more of the power over to the political sphere rather than to the banking sphere. But, uh, you know, as I said in my last book, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization, we have this collusive arrangement between politics and finance. And this has gone on from basically the founding of the Bank of England in 1694, where the banks and the politicians got together to support one another. Uh, at that time, King William III of England, uh, when he came to the throne, he wanted to fight this war against France and he needed financing for that war. But uh, there's a limit to how much you can impose taxes on your subjects. So William Patterson and his cohorts came to the king and they said, uh, if you will give us the Bank of England the privilege of creating banknotes and lending them into circulation at interest, we will make sure you get all the money you need to fight the war. So no sooner did the Revolutionary War end and the United States was organized uh, into a new nation, than we had a replica of the Bank of England system created with the first bank of the United States. 
which was instigated by Alexander Hamilton and some of his cohorts. So the First Bank of the United States, modeled after the Bank of England, uh, basically gave power uh, to the bank to create money on the basis of interest-bearing loans. So we've had that system replicated in every country around the world ever since. So we have all of these central banks that cooperate with one another uh, to maintain this structure where you have this collusive arrangement between governments and bankers. What's going on now with this free fall? I mean, it's, it's global, this pseudo Marxist solution. Maybe it's not pseudo. Uh, to all this collapsing by just throwing money at people. I think in Canada, they were giving people for the health issue, 2,000 uh, Canadian dollars a month. I think they might still be doing that. United States, we got a $1,200 stipend one time goodbye. Um, trillions and trillions and uh, many European countries also. I know my friends in uh, Belgium were getting $2,000 a month. So people are talking about, well, first of all, I've been trying to tell people, you know, don't be so thrilled about this token that you're getting because it's all part of the, the, the they're throwing money away because they're bringing down the system. Do you believe, first of all, that there's a deliberate attempt to crash the system and therefore this money grab is a precursor to that? I guess there's not a first of all, that's my question. Well, the collapse of the global financial system has been inevitable for a long time. Now, the powers that be, I think, have a plan. Uh, whether it involves bringing down the current system to replace it with something else, uh, that's an open question. I won't speculate about that. In any case, the system is collapsing. And the handouts of money that we've seen over the past uh, several months, uh, since uh, about the beginning of March, uh, have been a response to keep demand up. You know, corporations uh, depend on profits and, and sales. And if people don't have any money, they can't buy anything. So that's why they've been creating this, uh, uh, this money, basically out of thin air, to hand off to people what Ben Bernanke called helicopter money, uh, just to keep demand up and keep the system going. So that won't continue indefinitely. It's, it's totally inflationary because it's not based on any additional production. Uh, to be valid, money needs to be created on the basis of goods and services that are in the market or soon to arrive in the market. And uh, this money is just being created by fiat without any sound basis at all. So, you know, it's helpful to, uh, to us who, who need the money, people who have lost their jobs, businesses that have had to uh, close up because of the market closures and the social distancing and all the other things that have been imposed on the economy. So this is a necessary stopgap. It's sort of uh, Keynesian economics on steroids, but, uh, it's, it's something that uh, cannot be sustained. And now the Federal Reserve is setting their inflation target up to 4%, and it'll probably go higher than that because they're recognizing that they don't have really any control over that. Uh, they're just warning us that this is what's gonna happen. Can you so, help us understand the, the difference between runaway inflation and depression? I mean, remember you're talking to some lay people here. <clears throat> Yeah, well, there are many causes of depression. Uh, if you look back to the 1930s, uh, that depression was caused by the banks being unwilling to uh, expand credit. Uh, they created a credit bubble during the Roaring Twenties, and then when uh, when some of those loans that they created uh, were not able to be serviced, uh, they put on the brakes and constricted credit. And uh, so there was a dearth of money in circulation. So more and more people were unable to pay what they owed. Uh, businesses were unable to pay what they owed. So you had a lot of people uh, being unemployed because businesses were closing up. 
and uh, this financial crisis uh, spilled over into the economy. So <clears throat> that was uh, that was the problem back then. The problem now is different. The problem now is market closures and uh, keeping people apart so they can't transact business in the normal way. The only way that we can transact business now is through uh, remote platform businesses like Amazon, eBay, uh, Google, Apple, and the other platform businesses that have basically uh, become uh, monopolies uh, on the internet. And all of the mom and pop stores and the restaurants and gyms uh, have had to close for a long period of time. And many of these businesses uh, cannot sustain uh, months of losses of revenues and so that they will be closed permanently. So it looks like we're going through perhaps another major revolution like the Industrial Revolution. With the Industrial Revolution, we had a shift from uh, self-sufficient uh, small producers and uh, small farmers using the commons. But we had two things happen at the same time. We had the enclosure of the commons, which forced people to pay uh, rent to the lords who took over that land, or to move into the cities and find work in the satanic mills uh, of the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> so we had those two things that were making it possible for large corporations to form, for capital be de to, to be concentrated, uh, land to be concentrated in the hands of fewer people. So that was a major shift in the uh, economic uh, uh, landscape. So we may be going through a similar thing now with the destruction of small and medium-sized enterprises to a large extent. And uh, what are people going to do? We have uh, automation at the same time killing jobs that we have uh, small businesses being destroyed uh, by these uh, drastic economic measures uh, imposed from the political sphere. Uh, how that's all gonna play out, it's hard to say. You know, I've been looking at uh, other possibilities where people can take power to themselves uh, by finding new ways to sustain themselves in a process of transition, a metamorphic transition from what I call the caterpillar economy to the butterfly economy. What do you understand is the butterfly economy? Well, let's look at the uh, let's look at the caterpillar to the butterfly as the metaphor. Uh, if you look at the cycle, it begins with an egg that's laid by a butterfly and the egg hatches out into a caterpillar. And the caterpillar does nothing but eat and grow. And it continues to eat and to grow. And it can be terribly destructive in the process, uh, defoliating plants and trees and uh, basically devastating uh, those plants. But at some point, there's something in the caterpillar program that tells it to stop. And at that point, it spins a cocoon or forms a shell around itself and enters the chrysalis stage. And the chrysalis stage, what happens is the caterpillar body disintegrates into a nutrient soup. Now there were within the caterpillar body the whole time, what biologists call imaginal cells or imaginal disks. And these cells begin to multiply and uh, combine together to form the new structures of the butterfly body. And when that process is complete, uh, the butterfly cracks open the shell and emerges as a new creature. It has the entirely same DNA as the caterpillar, but its behavior is entirely different. While the caterpillar was destructive, uh, 
the uh, butterfly is coevolutionary and symbiotic with the plants. It flies around, it uh, collects pollen from the blossoms and helps to pollinate the plants, helping them to propagate themselves. And so uh, it's uh, co-creative. Except that it has a very short lifespan, if we want to pick <clears throat> one of the metaphor. Uh, that's true. So I don't know how far we can extend this metaphor, but I think <laughs> we, we can look at uh, the current process as being entering the chrysalis stage. Uh, okay. The old caterpillar economy is disintegrating and we're entering what's been called the, uh, the great pause, uh, which is really what happens in the chrysalis stage. We have this great pause and we uh, subsist on what we've accumulated uh, through the caterpillar stage. <clears throat> and we have accumulated a great amount of, uh, of resources during the industrial era. So the challenge now is uh, for us to distribute those accumulated resources in a way that allows the imaginal cells, uh, those individuals and organizations and groups uh, that are destined to create the butterfly to subsist and to come together and successfully manage the transition from the caterpillar economy to the butterfly economy. Okay, so leaving the metaphor behind, are you talking about the redistribution of wealth? Uh, absolutely, there needs to be a redistribution of wealth. And, and how do we uh, go about that, uh, besides complete anarchy? Well, that's, that's an open question, and uh, I don't have all the answers to that. However, if, uh, if large corporations uh, go bankrupt for lack of patrons, and lack of sales, uh, that is bound to happen. So I don't know. A lot depends on what the politicians are willing and able to do at that point. I seem to be doing a pretty lousy job, if you'll pardon the vernacular. I mean, you know, uh, this event or this health issue, which I question daily, uh, is, you know, it looks like de the Great Depression to me. I mean, I'm not an economist, but, you know, every day you hear the airlines are going under. The, the, yesterday I heard that um, the, one of the big cinema groups is closing 30,000 cinemas. There goes the um, film industry, and it's just this this rapid rolling stone uh, of um, economic disaster, and um, it just seems that this health event seems to keep regenerating itself. It looks like what was originally looked like an emergency is now a state of existence, and um, I just wonder. Uh, I mean, I think everyone is wondering how we're going to dig our way out of this one. Do you, it looks like it's going to be perpetual. I mean, you know, you only need to look at one of the thriving industries, which is uh, the mask and the designer mask and the beaded uh, ivory satin bride mask, the matching masks for clothes to realize, and we won't, I don't need, I'll try not to get political here and talk about all the deals that were made by people in politics buying mass quantities of the masks and then uh, suddenly reporting that we will be wearing them for another two and a half months. Gee, and so, I wonder why. But uh, it seems certainly like we are heading into a Great Depression. So I guess I should be somehow reassured that you say it's not the same as a depression, but if this continues, I mean, you talked about corporations needing money. Well, the two, the twelve hundred dollar grant from the government barely is going to cover that. I mean, where people are lucky, they had enough to pay rent for a couple of months, if that. So, where are we headed? Well, you're right. It is a very fluid situation. We have concurrent inflation and depression. You know, it's not a choice between the two. Okay, uh, so let me interrupt you because I want to be clear about that. that's something I didn't understand. Concurrent inflation and depression. Oh my God. And I only interrupted you to bring, because I think it's an important point. 
Well, there are a lot, a lot of things that I don't agree with Milton Friedman about, but he said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So it's what the monetary authorities do that causes inflation. And as I mentioned previously, uh, just creating money uh, by fiat without a sound basis in the real production uh, creates inflation. That means uh, monetary inflation results in price inflation. We have to make a distinction between the two and understand the causal relationship. Uh, depression is caused by uh, closure of markets, uh, inability of people to buy and sell, uh, lack of means of consumption. So we have both of those things going on with concentration of wealth in the hands of uh, uh, the people at the very top. You know, uh, over the last uh, 40 years or so, beginning perhaps with the uh, Reagan-Thatcher era, uh, we've had an increasing disparity in wealth and incomes uh, with repeated tax cuts that have favored basically the rich. Uh, the lower levels uh, of income uh, groups, uh, the first uh, of the five quintiles or the first and second quintiles, uh, have seen their incomes stagnate over the last 40 years uh, or in some cases fall. And uh, most of the benefits of increased productivity have gone to the upper levels. And those charts are readily, readily available online. You can see how extreme it has become. And uh, especially with this latest round of tax cuts uh, during the Trump era, uh, basically all of that has gone to the top income groups. So, you know, that's a self-destructive process. It's like uh, a meta metastatic cancer where, or an autoimmune disease where the body consumes itself. And that's what's going on. That's part of the disintegration of the caterpillar economy. As long as the politicians remain committed to trying to perpetuate the caterpillar economy, uh, this is going to be a worsening crisis. Uh, eventually, uh, it's going to have to be recognized that major changes in systems and structures are going to have to be taken on. And uh, I think this process is going to occur from the bottom up, not from the top down. Uh, it will start at the local community level working its way up to the state level. And uh, I think the, uh, the nation states that we are used to are going to look uh, entirely different uh, as we come out of this. You know, that's very interesting. In, in our last conversation, you spoke about healthy cities and transition towns. And uh, we see with this Agenda 21, the worsening of the urban situation, the destruction of cities as, as far as centers of um, benefit to, to the participants. And uh, I'm sure you're well aware of Agenda 21 and the housing that they're putting in. And I, I thought, uh, I'm hoping that we can quite elaborate this idea that you share and shared then about local community living and transition towns, and um, how soon, because it was 10 years ago you were talking about that, do you feel that this is underway? Because I'm seeing a lot of people are, are leaving the cities, which has been my mantra all my life, get out of the cities. In fact, I've ended up on an island far, far away. <laughs> and if I could get further away, I would, but there's nothing left, it's just ocean. Um, but do you feel that uh, we're getting there that there's an expansion of this communal um, self-empowerment civilization that you so uh, brilliantly envision for the future. Because if we don't, <clears throat> I don't know what will follow. Well, there are a number of things that have been going on. You know, uh, looking over the last uh, 50 years or so, 60 years, you know, we had the flower children of the 60s, and that was really uh, a social revolution. It was. And, I was part of that. Yeah. 
And uh, we had a lot of things happen since then. Uh, Paul Hawken writes about that in his book, Blessed, Unwell, uh, Blessed Unrest. And he talks about all the positive things that have been happening. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, development in many different sectors. I think many people have been working on themselves as individuals. Uh, a lot of pop psychology sprung up during the 1960s and 70s. I know I was part of that. Uh, I was a member of the Association for Humanistic Psychology, and there were a lot of things going on. Uh, <clears throat> we had the emergence of many personal growth uh, modalities, transactional analysis, uh, uh, gestalt therapy, yoga, meditation, and more and more people have been doing these things. You know, when I first started doing yoga, Back in 1974, people thought it was something weird. Uh, now everybody's doing yoga, which is a great thing. Uh, we've also had uh, people focusing on uh, local sustainability. I was part of a group that started Sustainable Tucson oh, about uh, 13 or 14 years ago. And virtually every city around the country now has a sustainability office as part of their official government. So <clears throat> we have increasing focus on sustainability and local concerns. Uh, there's been an enormous rise of interest in local currencies and alternative exchange systems. Uh, we've seen the trends of people moving out of the cities uh, into smaller towns and communities. We've also seen more recently people leaving the workforce. Uh, I wrote about that recently in my, my latest newsletter that I sent out a couple of days ago, uh, part of my Walking Away series. Many people are walking away from conventional employment and finding ways to subsist by diversifying their skills, uh, by learning how to be frugal and separate what they need from what they really don't need. That can yeah, I interrupt yeah. here to make a comment that that's one sure. of the beautiful things about this health crisis and, and that I've been talking about this with others as well, that suddenly we're faced with, I don't really need that new everything, purse, shoes, clothes, gadget, uh, because number one, you can't go shopping for it anyway because you're masked and bound in your house. And two, you, it, it's a beautiful, opportunity, even though it's so painful, for people to start evaluating, exploring, well, wait a minute, what do I really need? And in that way, it's a beautiful thing that's happening because number one, planet Earth is getting a big breath release from all this human behavior and consumption. And number two, it's giving us an opportunity to ask those questions, who am I really? What is my connection to the earth? What do I really need versus what do I, what is mindless buying? You hear people talking about their sport is going to the mall to go shopping. And so that's being stripped away. And it's, it's quite very exciting to see the beautiful side of this situation. I'm sure you would agree with that. I do, and I, I, I speak from personal experience. When I left my academic career behind in 1979, uh, I had to make some very, really tough decisions about, well, where do I spend the next nickel or dime? Because uh, I, I just didn't have the income to live anywhere near the way I had lived before. So I had to really learn lessons in frugality had to give up a lot of things that were non-essential. And in the process, uh, I found satisfaction in non-material things. So yeah, that's uh, a big part of the process that we're going through. One of the questions that I, I have for you is, okay, and in this process of transition and uh, transition towns as you stay, we still have a big problem of government interference because they're going after people that are living off the grid. They're going after you if you're trying to do water cash. 
they're going after you if you're gardening vegetables on your land. Um, so, you know, and of course, recently we, we saw that you're not allowed to buy seeds in the stores. Uh, they do not want us to become transitional towns and self-sufficient people. And yet they don't seem to have an idea of what to mm -hmm. offer rather other than urban hysteria and control grids and dehumanizing environments. The system subsists on the basis of our dependencies. Right. So uh, how do we break that? How do we break it? We, the, kind of a circular conversation. It's like, mm -hmm. right. So how do we break out of this system? Does it, do, does it self-destruct or do we envision our ability to uh, become so autonomous in a way and in a community sense that that shift just is a natural process of our evolution. How do you see that? Well, there are two, two things that you can do. You can do things individually and you can do things in cooperation. Both of these are necessary. You know, what we can do as individuals is limited. You can find your niches of self-sufficiency by cultivating a variety of skills and uh, being able to do more for yourself. There are always some resources available. You know, I have friends who are able to uh, collect things off the curb, perfectly useful stuff. It's amazing what people throw away. And uh, it's becoming harder to dumpster dive these days because dumpsters are often locked down now, but uh, it's still possible. And uh, to a large extent, uh, there's a lot of sharing going on and ever more. There's a website called shareable.org, I believe it is. And there are all kinds of ways that people can share with one another and do it outside of the monetary economy. Uh, so yeah, there are things that we can do individually and things that we can do together. But ultimately we have to pull together as communities to support one another to assert our rights. And uh, asserting our rights is a big part of the program. What do you say to the growing homeless situation? How do we clean this problem up? I mean, obviously, I I've seen some of these people interviewed and they say, to be honest with you, I'm here for the drugs. So it's <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Um, no, I don't really want to leave the, the ghetto because uh, there are great drugs here and that's what I'm for. So, you know, there is that free will element, but then there are also so many people that are, are just, um, it's broken by the uh, malfunctioning economy slash social uh, model. What do you say to that? Do you have any visions of how, to, how this will ever be resolved? Well, sure. The homelessness problem is tied up with the uh, problems of addiction and crime and, uh, and other aspects that are social. And you can't solve one without solving the others. Uh, I have a friend who lives in Oregon, interviewed him recently on one of my podcasts, and uh, he has uh, 50 ways to solve the problem of homelessness which he has presented to the city officials in Eugene, Oregon, but gotten very little take up uh, on those proposals because basically uh, people who are not homeless don't want to solve the homeless problem. They just want it to go away. Uh, they want the, pro the problem to go somewhere else. Uh, and uh, dealing with the social problems is the more difficult part of it. Why do people become addicted in the first place? Now, I'm not qualified to speak on that to any great extent, but uh, you know, these are things that need to be addressed. Well, you may not be qualified to speak about drug addiction, but as a reflection of an underground or hidden economy, black economy, uh, a lot of individuals and corporations are getting very rich on keeping people uh, addicted. That's an economy question. Yeah, well, that, that's true. 
and it's not only the obvious things that we're addicted to, you know, we're also addicted to our cell phones and our Facebook. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's an excellent film that came out recently called The Social Dilemma, which uh, outlines this from people who are inside the system, uh, <clears throat> how it actually causes people to become addicted by directing their attention uh, to things that they've already been biased toward. So the objective is to keep them on the screen where they will be exposed to more and more of the ads that produce revenue for Facebook and Twitter and these other uh, platform businesses. It's also that uh, corporations create our artificial needs. You know, take one example, deodorant. <laughs> I confess, I do not use body deodorants. Uh, I prefer to uh, use uh, water and soap or just water alone and a washcloth. Yeah. And uh, so I don't, I don't buy any cosmetics really. Uh, they, uh, they make us think that, oh, well, you're gonna have bad breath if you don't use our toothpaste or our mouthwash. Well, baking soda does a fine job of uh, uh, solving the bad breath problem. Um, and uh, soap and water do a great job of solving the body odor problem. Baking soda and water under the armpit is also a wonderful <clears throat> solution for any problem right. in that department. Right. And, um, and likewise, and likewise uh, foot powder. Baking soda works well as foot powder. So they're common everyday substances that we have in the home that can be used to solve most of the problems. Vinegar is a great cleaning agent. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is a great uh, thing to use. These are all inexpensive. Yeah, you're speaking my language. I'm all about alternative. I don't take any pharmaceuticals <laughs> at all, at all. Uh, and, you know, even an aspirin, when I get a headache, I lie down, put some ice on my head and just close my eyes and get to put a fan on myself to, and let it pass. Um, so, right. you know, right. talk about a, a, an economy breaker. I mean, I, I, I don't know, as far as personal economy, how many, I don't know any people who don't take medication. Another major addiction is the addiction that our farmers have to uh, chemicals, uh, artificial pesticides and fertilizers and, uh, and herbicides uh, that has become the way of farming, which is unsustainable because it's destroying the topsoil through tilling and killing the microorganisms uh, that create healthy soil. Uh, another great film that I saw just a few days ago is called uh, Kissed, Kiss the Ground. And uh, it's a presentation that shows how no-till or low-till uh, chemical-free agriculture is actually more profitable and far more sustainable uh, than what we've been doing for the past 50 years. So, you know, this is, uh, this is going to kill uh, uh, Dow and uh, the other big chemical companies uh, that have been depending on our addiction to these chemicals and chemical agriculture processes. Not to mention Monsanto. Monsanto, that's the one I was trying to think of. And the killers, the, what is it called? The Terminator seed. Terminator seed, yeah, um, that's I've a, recently thing. heard that uh, India has been successful in kicking Monsanto out. Bravo for them. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, this is another thing. Uh, they try to prevent farmers from saving seeds. They want us to become dependent on um, on them for their patented seeds, their hybrid seeds, their gen genetically modified Terminator seeds. seeds. You, can yeah. only, you can only use them once, that's it. And this, this is ultimately a dead end. And uh, we're just destroying the planet in the process. You know, we have a multidimensional mega crisis that's ongoing. Uh, pollution, resource depletion, uh, climate change, um, breakdown of institutions, increasing politicization of everything uh, across the board. Uh, we need to restructure all of our critical uh, infrastructure and institutions. Not hard to see 
the dysfunctions. They're everywhere you look. Yes. Question for you. What is your understanding of the Nasara plan? It's being touted by several people. Some of them are just pseudo economists. Some of them are new age voices. And uh, as being envisioned as the Jubilee solution, <clears throat> the Jubilee system that breaks us free of the globalist plan. Are you aware of this Nasara Jasara dynamic? I've I've heard of it, but I'm not, I don't really know enough about it to comment. Okay, uh, because you know, I find it a little utopic. I don't believe in utopia, at least maybe not, maybe on another planet. I don't believe mm. in the paradigm of utopia on either left or right side. I believe in uh, the power of the individual and community to rise as, as you see to rise and create new structures. But uh, once anybody starts dishing out a utopic solution, um, I stand back and go, okay, and how is that supposed to happen? Because this, this Nassar is supposed to be, it's like Marx's utopia, but no more debt, uh, free healthcare, free schools. So where does the money come for this? How, what sustains all this free stuff? Well, there is no free lunch, uh, as was fam uh, as was famously famously said by, I think the aforementioned Milton Friedman. <clears throat> yeah, everything has to be paid for, but we need to stop thinking of it in terms of monetary uh, terms. We need to think of it in terms of goods and services. Uh, what ultimately are the goods and services that are required? And how do we marshal those goods and services to solve the problems that we have? <clears throat> now, I've focused on creating a better money system, but there are basically three ways that value gets transferred. Uh, first, you have the gift. Uh, you give me something without expecting anything in return. Thank you very much. Uh, then there is the forced uh, exchange where you hold me up at gunpoint and say, your money or your life. And uh, I either hand over the money or I say goodbye to my life. But the third and the most prominent form of uh, value transfer is the reciprocal exchange, where we make an agreement. Uh, I will give you this if you give me that. Now, on the most primitive level, uh, it's a barter and we find something that each of us wants. But that's a very limited uh, possibility because it depends on a coincidence of wants and needs. I need to have something you want, you have to, you have to need something, uh, you, you need to have something I want. So that's why money was invented. So we create this uh, exchange medium. Now in the beginning, we just found some uh, some commodity that was in general demand, and we use that as an exchange medium. <clears throat> so, for example, we might use salt or tobacco or some other commodity that was in general demand. Uh, salt, for instance. Uh, everybody needs and wants salt. So, you've got something I want, I've got some salt, I give you the salt you uh, can then find something that you want from somebody else and pay them with salt. Uh, tobacco might be a better example. In the colonies of the Americas, tobacco was widely used as an exchange medium. So I may not have any use for tobacco myself, but since everybody else or most everybody else does, I will accept it in payment for whatever goods and services I have to sell. So that was the first stage of uh, reciprocal exchange, commodity money. Uh, then we had uh, symbolic money. Uh, typically, the commodities that were favored were gold and silver because they were uh, divisible into small units. They were relatively scarce. Uh, people liked them for different reasons, ornamentation, uh, and there was a mystique around gold and silver, especially gold. Uh, and it has been over millennia, a widely used medium of exchange. So 
when banking got established, uh, the banks would take your gold and deposit it for safekeeping and then give you a warehouse receipt, a bank note, they called it, uh, which would be redeemable back to gold on your demand. So the banks discovered that they had uh, very little call for redemption. So they said, uh, well, let's see, maybe we can issue bank notes um, in excess of the gold that we have on reserve. We'll issue the notes on the basis of other goods and services that the borrower might have, collateral. So that's what they did. Eventually they went beyond the value of the collateral and they began to create banknotes by fiat. That's where the trouble started. Uh, the creation of banknotes on the basis of other valuable goods and services is perfectly fine, so long as it does not exceed the value of those goods and services. But when the banks and the governments got together in collusion, uh, they went beyond those limits and started creating money by fiat. And that's what causes the inflation that we have experienced uh, over the long term ever since. So what we need to do is not reform that system, but completely transcend it to devolve power uh, to the more local level and keep the control of the allocation of credit uh, in small local units and not allow banks to get so big, not allow governments to get so big and powerful either. So we see the devolution of power both in politics and in finance with uh, the breaking up of nations. You know, this is going on across the world you have Spain breaking up into Catalonia, the Basque country, Andalusia, and others. Uh, you have uh, an urge for devolution of power in the EU. The EU started as an economic union, became a political union. Part of it became a financial or monetary union, not all of it. And uh, because that monetary unit did not extend to fiscal union, that is sharing their burden of debts, uh, that is beginning to disintegrate as well. Yes. <clears throat> and California is trying to break away from the United States of America. Well, I, th I think ultimately we will see the United States break up into a number of different segments uh, with the local communities and the states uh, going their own way. It will be a, a secession based on a better basis than the former secession of the 1860s that was based on the desire to maintain slavery. <clears throat> so what do you have to say to a person who is at this time struggling? I, I just wanted to interject before I finish that question also that you were speaking how <clears throat> we're having a lot of commerce on the web. And my thought when you said that comment was, what happens if they decide to turn it off? There's a lot of talk about them being able to shut down the web. And um, what would that mean to the transition that people have been making? I'm one of them to be working to conducting my business on, on internet. What happens when they shut that down? That's a lot of power. Well, if they shut down the internet, what happens to Amazon? What happens to Facebook? You know, it's, uh, I can hardly imagine shutting down the whole web. They can try to control it, uh, which they they've are been trying doing. to control it. They can, they can control it by uh, creating these massive uh, monopolies or oligopolies. You know, initially the, uh, the internet uh, was the commons, but just like the physical commons, it has been increasingly privatized and taken over by these major platform businesses that I mentioned, Google, Amazon, eBay, Facebook. Uh, uh, yes. You and uh, it's happening, it's happening with payments too. You have uh, Alipay and uh, WhatsApp and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Facebook's new 
Uh, they're calling it Novi now. It hasn't been launched yet, but it will be. Uh, this all has to be decentralized. Now, how that's going to happen is difficult to say, but it depends on us working together uh, to create new structures from the bottom up and reduce our dependence on the existing structures. There are such things as, as mesh networks that have the potential to replace the internet, and I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable about that to say a lot, but you can do some research on it. Um, and we can create uh, neighborhood networks that can then be networked together into wider area networks. So people are working on these things and uh, there are possibilities emerging. So what, in the, to, back to the question that I interrupted myself on, what do you say to people who are in the midst of, of real financial turmoil at the time when the businesses are shut down, they're being, you know, I mean, in, in Rome, you get a $500 fine if you go out without your mask, between five and a thousand euros, that is, uh, if you're caught without your mask. And so people are, are in so much fear and obedience in this artificial control, well, it's not artificial, the system of control. What words of comfort can you provide people as to the vision of, um, what you see for the future and how feasible it is for us to get there. Well, we all have our red lines that we are not willing to cross. You know, for the time being, I'm willing to wear a mask to go shopping. I, I do not wear a mask when I go outside and take a walk in the neighborhood or in the park. And fortunately, most other people uh, in my neck of the woods do not do that either. Uh, there are no fines being imposed on people here. Uh, it's more stringent apparently in Italy, uh, where you're talking about, and other places where fines are being imposed uh, with very little uh, substance in reason. But people have to decide for themselves to what extent they're willing to comply. And uh, ultimately there will be a line of non-compliance that I will not cross and others are going to have to make that decision. And if we do that en masse, peacefully, uh, there's no way that uh, anyone can stop it. And if fines are imposed, uh, we can support one another either in uh, refusing to pay or in helping each other uh, to pay because they will single out uh, test cases uh, or examples uh, to make. And so we have to support those that are being made an example of. Very true. Thomas, I'm going to wrap it up now. And so I'd, I'd like to, before I uh, ask you for your web information for the people that are watching, I'd <clears throat> like to know if there's one last uh, message you have for the people that are listening to this interview. Yeah, my message is uh, be optimistic, be cheerful. This is an exciting time. We can come through this better than before. Uh, don't try to go it alone. Reach out to your neighbors, your friends, your family. It's time to come together as imaginal cells in the emerging butterfly body to become who we were meant to be as humans and uh, be peaceful, be nonviolent, help one another. Uh, don't answer in kind when people come at you with something rough or violent. Um, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Uh, help one another and we'll all be better off. It's beautiful. Thank you for that. Economist, pacifist, visionary, Thomas Greco. Thank you, Thomas, so much. How do people reach you? Please give us your, I will also type it out in the intro information, but could you just tell people your website contact, please? Sure. The best way is my main website. It's beyondmoney.net 
beyondmoney.net. I also have a newsletter that I send out periodically. Uh, I have a Twitter account, a Facebook account. You can follow me on any one of those. And I recommend that people read the book, The End of Money, The Future of Civilization. Really a beautiful piece of work. So, all right, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Thank you so much again. And um, peace to you. Let's hope we pull through this greater and stronger and wiser and more human than we have been before. Thank you, Patricia, for the opportunity. Thank you, Thomas. You take care. All right, everybody, you've been listening to Beyond the Matrix, the program that asks you to think outside the box and take from this dialogue visions of uh, where we're heading and uh, how we're going to recreate, reinvent ourselves, our societies, and our civilization. Take care. Bye-bye.